I'm Monse Alvarado. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly, exclusive announcement. The Knights of Columbus make a major decision about artwork from former Jesuit Father Marco Rupnik. We speak with Supreme Knight Patrick Kelly. A fire in France. Updates on the blaze at a 12th century Catholic cathedral in Rouen. Global gathering. The NATO summit wraps up in the nation's capital. What the group is saying about the war in Ukraine. And dual species. A report from Rome on a miracle involving the body and blood of our Lord. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the Feast of St. Benedict. I'm Monse Alvarado in for Tracy Sable. Our top story tonight, an EWTN News exclusive, a big announcement from the Knights of Columbus. The 2.1 million member global lay Catholic fraternal order has concluded the mosaics created by accused abuser Father Marco Rupnik will be covered up at the John Paul II Shrine in Washington, D.C., and the Knights headquarters in Connecticut. It's the strongest public stand yet by a major Catholic organization regarding the former Jesuits' embattled art. Supreme Knight Patrick Kelly made the announcement today at the EWTN studios. Kelly said the decision came after what he described as a comprehensive and confidential process. It involved extensive consultations with sexual abuse victims in the United States and those who minister to them, as well as art historians, pilgrims to the John Paul II Shrine, bishops, and moral theologians. Once a renowned artist, Father Rupnik's mosaics are featured in hundreds of Catholic landmarks around the world. The Jesuits expelled Father Rupnik in June of 2023. It came after allegations of highly credible serial, spiritual, psychological, and sexual abuse of as many as 30 religious sisters spanning decades came to light. Some of those women allege Rupnik's abuse occurred as part of the process of creating the art at the school he founded in Rome. Last week, Bishop of Lourdes Jean-Marc Mikas released his statement on the artwork, noting he's still discerning what to do next, but that as a first step, the artwork would not be lit up for the nightly candlelit rosary processions. Last week, Cardinal Sean O'Malley of Boston, the Pope's top advisor on sexual abuse by clergy, also weighed in. He asked Vatican officials not to use the former Jesuit priest's art. Waiving the Statue of Limitations in October 2023, Pope Francis allowed a canonical investigation into the abuse allegations. The Knights' decision to permanently cover up the art rests on the Vatican's final ruling on Rupnik's open cases. In my first question to Supreme Knight Patrick Kelly, I asked him about how the decision came together. So we have taken the decision to cover in fabric the art of, of Father Rupnik, okay, until such time as the Vatican concludes their investigation into the, the alleged abuse of Father Rupnik. And at that point in time, we'll make another decision which could, could entail actually permanently covering the art in plaster. This is significant. There are many places that have discussed the idea of having to deal with eventually the artwork of alleged abuser Father Rupnik, but at the same time, um, they have not actually moved in a very specific way, the way that you have now. What did this process look like for you in discerning this decision today? It was, it was a, a process that we knew we had to be very deliberative. We knew we couldn't uh, react emotionally to this because the shrine, the, the John Paul II National Shrine is a major facility. It's a major national shrine. So we knew we had to be very careful with what we did. We had to talk to victims and others, which, which, which we did. And also the decision that we came to was a decision for this shrine in the United States. And that's an important point because the United States has been particularly, I would say, rocked by sexual abuse. So we needed to decide what was right for the John Paul II shrine in the United States. And the context of that really mattered. Now, these allegations against Rupnik, they came to light in 2022. When did your process to consider the fitness of this artwork begin? Um, what you explained what it entailed, but what was the timing related to it? So as soon as the allegations were made, what we did at the Knights of Columbus and at the John Paul II Shrine is we removed Rupnik art from all of our 
all of our digital platforms, the website, everything we have digitally, and we removed his art from all of our catechetical materials, our print materials. So that was the first thing we did. And then late last year, when the Vatican s said that they were opening up an investigation into these alleged abuses, then we decided we need to take a serious look at the mosaics themselves. Why was this process never revealed? It seems the process was very confidential. You've been asked multiple times by members of the Knights of Columbus, some here locally in Washington, D.C., and about the Catholic press about this artwork. Why keep it secret? Yeah, well, we said at the time when we were asked, we said that we are carefully considering the best course of action. So we said that. But we needed to have a confidential process primarily because we were talking to victims and we needed candor and openness from these victims to speak freely from their heart and that only happens particularly with victims in an atmosphere of confidentiality where we build trust so that's why i mean that's why the the process for us was confidential and that's why we were very careful what we said for all these all these months so then why now? You've got the Bishop of Lourdes who has decided that he's undergoing his own process and has a very personal opinion about what to do with the artwork. Cardinal O'Malley came out on June 28th. Um, you had the fallout of some very difficultly worded uh, responses from the head of the communications dicastery in Atlanta a couple of weeks back. Why now? Well, I have tremendous respect for Cardinal O'Malley and, and, and what he did and what he said. I would say that wasn't a catalyst for us. But the Lourdes decision, what, what, what the Bishop of Lourdes did was very important for us. When they set a time frame on their decision, we thought that we needed to also set a time frame for our decision. So that really, that really moved us forward. And I would say, in, in my own mind, personally, I knew June or July was going to be decision time here. So that, that is a bit of how we, we approach the timing of it. The Vatican and um, Vatican leadership have been accused of not caring enough about the victims, especially in this situation. Was their suffering a motivator for you? The, their suffering was the, the primary motivator for us, right? When we talked to victims, what we learned was they want to be heard and they want to be seen, right? So, so that was our primary motivation. And I would say uh, I'm tremendously uh, thankful for these victims, for their, for their openness to talk to us and the courage that they had to do this. And that, and that really, it was the victims and, and their feelings and their testimonies that they gave to us, which was the primary consideration that we had. Is there anything that you can share about that? Well, for us, I mean, the victims, the victims, what they feel is they, like I said, they want to be heard and they want to be seen. Their concern was the presence of the mosaics um, presents a chance for, for, for harming them further, for a, a kind of a re-traumatization of them. And so that's the consistent thing that we heard over and over. And, and, uh, and we really took that very seriously. Every Mass at the St. John Paul II National Shrine will now include a prayer of the faithful for victims of abuse. Saints with connections to abuse victims, such as St. Josephine Bakita, will be specially commemorated. The second part of this exclusive interview will air tomorrow, here on EWTN News Nightly, and is available on our YouTube channel. A fire at one of the tallest cathedrals in the world is now under control. The blaze broke out in the spire of the Rouen Cathedral in France just after midday. France's tallest cathedral was undergoing renovations. Officials say the fire was contained in an area of mostly metal, lowering the risk of flames spreading. The cause of the fire was deemed an accident. President Joe Biden holds a highly scrutinized news conference tonight with a very big audience watching, seeing how he handles reporters' questions. It all comes two weeks after his debate nosedive in Atlanta that led to his campaign fighting for its political life. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. That's right, Monsi. That highly anticipated news conference was slated to begin at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. Instead, it's been pushed back to later this evening here at the Walter E. Washington Convention Center in the nation's capital, where the NATO summit is underway. 
President Joe Biden arriving at another NATO workshop, meeting and greeting world leaders before they get down to more business. We must work ever more closely together to preserve peace and protect the rules-based international order. Thanks to your support. A little later, President Biden meeting with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. We are thankful to you and partners. And of course, we will discuss uh, achieving a just end to the war. Here they go. There goes one. The U.S. announcing a new $225 million aid package for Ukraine, including an additional Patriot missile system to bolster its air defenses against a deadly onslaught of Russian airstrikes, including one this week that hit a children's hospital. And we're working with our NATO allies to ensure Ukraine is flying F-16s this summer. And uh, we show the world that we stand with Ukraine now and in the future. In addition to providing more help to Ukraine, the Democratic incumbent fending off calls for him to step aside as the party's presumptive nominee, following that shaky debate performance against Republican Donald Trump. Other Democrats stand behind the president. And he can win this election, but I do think the Democrats across the spectrum need to either rally behind him uh, or just accept that this is his choice to make. Tonight's news conference, critical. A strong performance by President Biden could convince members of his party that he still has the ability to both win in November and to serve a second term. A weak effort, however, could make the calls for him to get out now grow even louder. As President Joe Biden wraps up the NATO summit with a rare solo news conference, on Friday it's back to the campaign trail when he heads to Detroit, Michigan. At the Walter E. Washington Convention Center, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Coming up later in the newscast, analysis of the NATO summit and what it means for the war in Ukraine. On Capitol Hill, Senate Democrats are huddling for the second time this week, trying to find out if President Biden's re-election campaign can survive. Meanwhile, former President Donald Trump nears an announcement of who's going to be his running mate. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us with the latest. Eric? Hey, good evening, Monse. Let's start with former President Donald Trump and his choice for vice president. Now that the NATO summit is over, I'm hearing an announcement may come as soon as tomorrow, ahead of Monday start of the Republican convention. According to reports, the list has narrowed. Senators J.D. Vance of Ohio and Florida's Marco Rubio, both pro-life lawmakers, are two of the top names mentioned. Now I spoke with both men about the possibilities. If you care about serving our country and you have an opportunity to serve in the executive branch and you want him to win because you don't think we can afford to have a, another four years like the last four years, unless there's a reason why you can't do it, you need to do it. And, and so, but no one, it's presumptuous because that hasn't happened for me or anybody else at this point. Haven't gotten the call yet. No. Senator J.D. Vance tells me no word yet. I'll let Donald Trump make that call and answer those questions. I'm just trying to do my job. On the other side of the ticket, panic mode continues for Democrats after Peter Welch of Vermont becomes the first Democratic senator to publicly call for President Biden to drop out. I'm expressing my opinion. You know, ultimately, the president's going to have to make his own decision. I think the issue is not about, uh, it's not about telling us, it's about uh, showing voters. And, that's, and the president's, you know, he's making real efforts to do that. Earlier today, Senate Democrats met at their campaign headquarters with senior Biden election advisors to hash out a way to move forward. Sources tell me these advisors are pulling a Harris-Trump matchup, and they say it's playing better than the current ticket. Afterwards, Joe Biden has to go to the American people, not just in one meeting, one press conference, one speech, but consistently and constantly the press conference will be potentially a turning point. But support among House Democrats continues to crumble. Several more today called for President Biden to withdraw. But Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries says conversations are ongoing. Those conversations have been candid, clear-eyed, and comprehensive. In other news, we have a follow-up to a story that we brought you yesterday. This afternoon, the Republican-controlled House failed to pass the inherent contempt resolution against Attorney General Merrick Garland. The resolution would have subjected the DOJ to fines and other penalties for not turning over the audio tapes of President Biden's interview with special counsel Robert Herr. Congresswoman Anna Polina Luna does plan to bring the resolution back later. Monse? 
Thank you so much, Eric. Another busy day on the Hill. We have a lot more still to come on EWTN News Nightly. Standoff on the high seas. Tensions are high as the Chinese ramp up their incursions into Taiwan's restricted waters. And another aid package for Ukraine. What could be the impact? We have analysis. Welcome back. Tensions are reaching a boiling point as Chinese Coast Guard ships cross into Taiwan's restricted waters. Taipei says four Chinese Coast Guard ships were in the restricted waters. They eventually left the area, then returned an hour later. Taiwan's Coast Guard says that this year alone, Beijing vessels have been in the restricted waters 31 times. As we reported earlier, Ukraine's leader is among those attending the NATO summit, and he's asking for more help for his war-torn country. We in Ukraine and all other neighbors of Russia, including those to whom America has alliance commitments, need answers. Our people are doing their best, the best of what is available to us in Ukraine. And we have proven more than once that the more we have, the harder it is for Putin to make war. Volodymyr Zelensky met congressional leaders, various heads of state, and President Joe Biden during the NATO summit. Here with more analysis of Zelensky's NATO visit and the meeting with President Biden is Doug Klain, a policy analyst at Razum for Ukraine. His research focuses on U.S. policy towards Ukraine and the Ukraine-Russia war. Doug, good to have you on. Biden and Zelensky just met a few weeks ago at the G7. How does today's discussion differ from that meeting? So this week at the NATO summit here in Washington, D.C., uh, the NATO alliance and NATO allies made uh, several significant announcements about new aid for Ukraine, uh, including the delivery of F-16 fighter jets, significant new air defenses, including Patriot batteries to help Ukraine defend its skies and civilians. Uh, but notably, there was no real progress made on political integration for Ukraine. Ukraine wants to get an invitation to join the NATO alliance, not to be admitted immediately, but at least to get an invitation invite and know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. The, even, the NATO alliance is talking about a bridge to membership, but we're not seeing that yet. Even that invitation, though, is hard because they're in a, a, a war-torn reality. Military support is being pledged to Ukraine at this summit, though, and it comes with directives on how to use it. Does that need to change? Absolutely. So we're in a weird situation where the Biden administration is actually placing restrictions on how Ukraine can use the weapons that the United States sends it. The Biden administration doesn't want Ukraine to use U.S. weapons to strike legitimate military targets in Russian territory. So this week on Monday, the Russians bombed a children's hospital in Kiev, the, one of the most modern hospitals in Europe. They destroyed it with a, a fighter bomber that took off from an air base in Russia. Ukraine is not allowed to use U.S. weapons to take out that air base. That's something that needs to change. President Zelensky said that decisive action can't be put on hold as the world awaits the November elections. Is the global community waiting to see who the next president will be to take major action against Russia? Maybe not to take major action against Russia, but the world is waiting on teeters to see what happens in November. And Zelensky said as much this week while giving a speech at the Reagan Foundation here in Washington. He said that Europe is looking to see what happens in November, and Vladimir Putin is looking to see who is the new next U.S. president. And that's something that Putin is very much hoping for. He's hoping to see Joe Biden leave, and he's hoping to see uh, somebody who's more friendly, who might be willing to make a deal with Russia. Uh, rather than helping Ukraine actually win the war. Well, is there quickly anything else that you want to add about what this, what this meeting and what these relationships mean for the future of Ukraine? One of the most important things right now is for the Biden administration not to hold Ukraine back, to, to stop this kind of drip feed of aid to Ukraine, to say decisively, we want to help Ukraine win not to stand with Ukraine as long as it takes, but let Ukraine do whatever it needs to do to push Russia's invasion forces out of its country and stop more children's hospitals from getting blown up by Russian bombs. Thank you, Doug. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. 
Up next on EWTN News Nightly, the Bible in 10 minutes. Father Schmitz has a new video why everyone is talking about it. Plus, a human heart muscle that scientists say is still alive after several centuries. We have a report from Rome. Catholic school in Wisconsin is taking action against a local school district. The district refuses to sell an elementary school building that has been vacant for two years, even rejecting a full price offer. The school district says St. Thomas Aquinas Academy could create competition for area public schools. Father Mike Schmitz tops the digital media world again. The popular Catholic priest's new offering has turned into his most watched video in its first 24 hours. Maybe you feel lost and your life is chaotic, but God is inviting you to be a part of the story he's writing. God wants to illuminate your life with this story and lead you. In the first 24 hours, the Bible in 10 minutes landed more than 358,000 views. Father Schmitz illustrates the Bible's story of salvation alongside colorful animations, including the Israelites' escape from Egypt and the Passion of Our Lord. Father Schmitz grew to prominence with the Bible in a Year podcast. It drew 660 million downloads worldwide. Finally tonight, there are a number of Eucharistic miracles throughout the world, including one in the Italian town of Lanciano. For years, it has attracted pilgrims. More recently, scientists have gone there too. EWTN Vatican journalist Paola Araiza has more. There are about 107 documented Eucharistic miracles approved by the Catholic Church. While some miracles include the protection of hosts, levitation and images of Jesus on the host, most of them are a manifestation of the flesh and blood of Christ. The first recorded Eucharistic miracle occurred in the Italian town of Lanciano in the 8th century, when a monk who doubted the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist celebrated Mass. The host turned into a part of the left ventricle, which is a part of the human body essential for the heart's function. This part of the myocardial tissue was both aching and bleeding. The wine then transformed into human blood and within a few moments changed from a liquid to a solid state into five coagulated blood drops. In 1970, at the request of the Archbishop of Lanciano and with the authorization of the Vatican, the Franciscans of Lanciano, guarding the relics, decided to examine them scientifically. Dr. Eduardo Linoli, head of the Laboratory of Clinical Analysis and Pathological Anatomy of the Italian Hospital of Arezzo, was entrusted with the study. First of all, he demonstrated that the, the flesh is a myocardial tissue is a fragment of heart. Second, the blood is true blood. And third, flesh and blood are human. And uh, fourth, the blood type, uh, he discovered uh, separately in, uh, in, blood, in, uh, in flesh and blood, that is AB blood type, the rarest in uh, humans, and then minerals in blood. Disappointed with the way the miracles were presented in mass media, but aware of their immense potential for apologetics and evangelization, Dr. Serafini decided to travel the world to examine some of the miracles himself. He explains that all the Eucharistic miracles he analyzed have several common features. They all presented suffering myocardial tissue and the AB blood type, which is the same blood type as can be found in the Shroud of Turin, as well as the presence of a strange elusive DNA. Unlike regular human DNA, the DNA found in Eucharistic miracles is not legible in its entirety. Some sequences are inexplicably missing, making the DNA impossible to trace or reproduce. Finding the same DNA in different Eucharistic miracles would be a too strong uh, um, confirmation of the uh, authenticity of the of Catholic Eucharist is something too strong, something that would uh, annihilate, destroy, or, and humiliate our faith. I think we had to believe in Eucharist. We don't have to uh, know the Eucharist as a proven and scientific fact. 
The Eucharistic miracle of Lanciano, while scientifically unexplainable and irreproducible, can be said to have occurred so that we may see and believe. For the faithful, Eucharistic miracles are a call to deepen their faith. They're seen as signs from God, meant to strengthen belief in the mystery of the Eucharist, which lies beyond human understanding. In Rome, Paola Riaza, IWTN News Nightly. We thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Monse Alvarado. Good night and God bless.